morning. Welcome to the happiest church on earth. And that, whenever we say that, that reminds us of who? Roy. And you've all caught up uh, today. I realized that there were at least a couple of people that came into church this morning that didn't know about Roy. But uh, just in case there's anybody here that didn't know, Roy had a very serious heart attack last Saturday night. And if he had been any place but where he was, I would probably be down in Loma Linda for a funeral service this weekend. And so we know that God allowed him to leave us and go to Loma Linda, but just not, not just that, God put him at the right place in that building at the right time. They'd been having this, this game night at the Drayson Center, and if he had been over where the dodgeball game was, if he had collapsed over there, he wouldn't have made it. But he went over by the pool where Dinah and the boys were, and uh, that's where the lifeguard, who was also an EMT, was, who had the courage, after they had done CPR on him for 11 minutes and couldn't bring him back, that's where this lifeguard had the courage to ask the doctors to step aside because they were diagnosing him with a stroke. And, uh, but the CPR wasn't working and he grabbed the defibrillator, which they only had there by the pool, and zapped him and brought him, brought him back. I talked to him on Thursday. He sounded weak, but his off-the-wall crazy sense of humor was still intact. Uh, he, he recognizes that God has given him uh, an extension and, uh, and it's for a purpose. And uh, so just keep him in your prayers. He's doing well. Uh, his heart is operating at about 60% right now. Uh, but he said if he follows the doctor's orders, which Dinah is committed to enforcing, uh, that uh, he should be able to get back to at least close to 100% over the next few months, but uh, told him, uh, I gave him love from all of us, and uh, he's accepted that. Uh, I've put in the e-news, I've put out his mailing address and his email address, so feel free to communicate with him in those ways is, is best. He does need time to rest. So we're thankful, thankful for Roy, thankful for, for God. Our new executive pastor will be here in the office on Tuesday. Tuesday and Wednesday, he and I will be meeting extensively and trying to get his office set up and, and uh, mine upset, un, upset, unset, whatever. I'm going to move a bunch of my books out somewhere and put some bookcases, move them around. And, uh, but he will be here as of Tuesday. His first Sabbath here will be the 14th because I will be gone next Sabbath. I don't want his first Sabbath here to be one when I'm not here because I'm really afraid of what you would tell him without me being present. So uh, the 14th, we're going to have a, a big potluck that day. Please bring extra, extra food. Let's make this a, a big event and celebrate Glenn and Melissa Gibson along with uh, Garrett and Gavin and Madeline to uh, come and join with our fellowship here. We're anxious to see that happen. Other announcements are in your bulletin. Please make note of them and participate as much and as frequently as you can in our fellowship offerings as well as our ministries. And now it's time for the children's story. So boys and girls, come on down. Do a, boys and girls, do a little searching. Look down these outside aisles. Look, look deep in the aisles. Look deep in the eyes of somebody who looks like they have more money than they're giving. Say thank you and come on down because Auntie Christie has a story for you.
morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. How are you? You're good. How many of you have ever been four years old? Have you been four years old? I have a story today that I want to tell you about a friend of mine who is four years old. Now, how many of you have ever been told you're not old enough to do that? You're not tall enough to do that. You have to wait till you get bigger. Have you heard that before? Well, my friend, her name was Alexandra, but we called her Alex, and she was four years old. And my friend Alex, she was sick. She had um, an illness that is called cancer, and she was just four years old. Can you believe that? And she was at a special hospital just for small children, people who are four years old. She was just the right age for that place. And she would, while she was getting her treatment, she would see other boys and girls in the hallways getting their treatments. And some of them didn't look so happy, they were sad. Because that's a hard thing to go through, right? When you should be out playing and swimming and being at school with your friends. And Alex had an idea. She, was, she told, told her mom, she said, Mommy, I really want to do something nice for the boys and girls that are at my hospital. And so what Alex decided to do is that she would raise money to help the boys and girls at her children's hospital. So what do you think she did? How many of you love something sour and sweet on a hot summer day? <gasps> Have any of you ever visited a lemonade stand on a hot summer day? It's the best treat, is it not? It's so delicious. When you're hot, it cools you right off. So what Alex decided to do is that she was going to make a lemonade stand right outside the hospital. And she sold lemonade to help raise money for other boys and girls in her hospital. And now today, every year across the country, there are Alex lemonade stands all over. And people, big people, little people, Young people, older people are all helping to raise money for boys and girls. But you know what I love about Alex? How old was she? She was four years old. And she decided to make a difference in the people's lives that she cared about. And do you know that you don't have to wait until you're tall enough or you're a certain age to do something for other people? You can start doing it right now. What's something that you can do for someone else to share Jesus' love with them? Pray for them. Yeah. Is there something else you can do? Help them up when they fall down. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, maybe if they're sick, you can help them, give them something to help them feel better your family. I love that idea. Yes, Amy, what could you do to help? If they fall, you can give them the band-aid. Yes, because band-aids make everything great. How can you help? Make a card. You can make a card. How would you help? Raise money. You could do that too. You guys had some great ideas. So what I want you to remember about the story today is that it doesn't matter how big, how small, how tall, how old you are, that Jesus can use you to help others and to share his love with them. Thank you. Have a happy Sabbath. Enjoy your day. Happy Sabbath. I had the pleasure and the honor of being with the early teens this morning. Mariana, thank you. Where's Chloe and Sean? You're back there. So we had a small group today. A lot of kids, looks like probably gone for the holiday weekend, but we had a delightful time. And I enjoyed hearing about their lives and what they're interested in doing this year and their teachers. And I was so struck with how much respect and love that they have for their teachers, many of whom they've had for a number of years in a row, sometimes up to three. And I thought how incredible that is, that their teachers can 
stay in that spot because I, I hear different stories when kids come in to see me. I hear different stories about what's going on at their school. So it was, it was wonderful to be with you this morning. Thank you. This morning, the offering is for church budget. And this time of the year, we always have a little less than we do, than we're supposed to. So as you think about today and your giving, please remember the church budget in that. Could the deacons please um, stand for the prayer? Our God and our Father, thank you for giving us everything that we have. Please help us to give right now what you would like us to. And please multiply it like the loaves and the fishes to give what your needs would like. We pray this in your holy, precious name. Amen. me as we seek the Lord in prayer. Our kind, loving, and heavenly Father, we are definitely two or more gathered here, and we know that you are here with us. Lord, I want to pray specifically for a thank you for Pastor Roy and the pre-planned minutia that you worked out that day from the fact that he was down there to where he was to who was there and that you were prodding their hearts Lord I know that you work in each of our lives that way involved in the littlest detail Lord as Jean Bazzani sits in the hospital for her fifth month I know that you are with her and that there's a purpose Please give her a ministry while she's there, Lord. A way to reach those around her in her circumstances for your honor and glory. Lord, please be with each family that's represented here. Be in the hearts and minds of people in the families and bring your love to each of those families in healing. Lord, please be with Melissa and Glenn Gibson as they relocate to our area. In the stress of the move, a new job, new, new circumstances, I pray that we immediately hold their ropes and instead of expecting ministry from them, that we minister to them. 
please help Pastor Glenn to fulfill the exact place that you want for him in our family here. Lord, most of our kids spend more time at school than they do at home. I pray for each teacher. I thank you for each teacher. I pray for the children's attitude toward their teachers and their classmates. And I pray that you give each of them love and acceptance so that they too have a happiest place on earth to grow up in. Thank you for this beautiful Sabbath and the rest that it brings us. Every Friday I just get chills when I anticipate the sun going down and what that means in my life. Thank you for your forethought. I pray this in your holy, precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. People who are, wow, now I'm crystal clear. I've asked the people who are up there doing the words and everything for us if they would please put the song number on the screen for you. So I'm hoping that's going to happen. I have no way to tell but other than to look and look right there. There it is. All right, so if you want to follow along in your hymnal, you can take out a green hymnal and you will find that song on the number that is up there on the screen. So I would invite you to join as we sing about something that is so amazing. It's amazing that when Jesus came to this earth, he gave us the ability to choose him and freely every single one of our sins are wiped out. That is something wonderful to sing about. Let's sing about it right now together.
the words to that song, but the next one is a song I've been singing my whole life, and I know that some of you have too. Please um, follow the guide on the screen, and we're going to sing Jesus Saves. Let's sing all the verses. free. Isn't that wonderful, wonderful news? And when we know that news, we can't keep it to ourselves, can we? No, we have to go tell people. So we're going to sing about telling our whole world that we're a Christian, wherever we are, whatever day of the week it is. Let's tell people that we're a Christian by the words we speak, by the actions we have, by the way we are with our Lord. Let's sing about it.
that so very much. Thank you for singing with me. And the next song that we're going to sing together has a even more special meaning because we are going to have this song be our special music today. So that means that we are going to sing it from our hearts. You've been singing from your hearts, I can tell. But join me now with this song, a Ralph Carmichael song. Um, what a gifted man. He has written so many beautiful songs. But the Savior is waiting right now, at this moment, at this time, to touch your heart, to touch my heart, to touch our whole family's hearts here in this room. Join me as we sing together. The Savior is waiting, and we will do the optional choral ending. So when you get to the end, the words are going to stay up there, and we're going to sing that last phrase a second time. singing the music. Thank you for being here. Anybody sitting in the back can't see? There's plenty of room right up front. Just uh, Right after church, I apologize. I, I won't be there to greet you at the door. The better looking part of the duo will be there to greet you. I've got to run straight over to Tulake and conduct a, a funeral for a family that did not have a pastor to, uh, to help them, and that starts at 1 o'clock, so I won't be there to, to hug you today, but we'll make up for it next time. Let me begin by just reminding you of some foundational statements that reflect where we've been, where I've been. Hi, Bob and Davey. Wow, that looks good. Um, to reflect where we've been over the last several months. Um, these statements 
I feel, summarize what I have demonstrated, hopefully, from God's Word alone, words to be true and relevant to where we are in time. You know, Adventists have, for a long time, we, we've preached an end-time message, haven't we? we? We've preached not only the advent of Christ, but the soon, relatively soon, advent of Christ. And as I see things unfolding in the world today, as I know what the press is waiting to hear from our nation's leadership and what appears to be almost uh, very soon and certainly to happen in Syria, and I just think, Lord, it's yours. Bring it on. But you know what? I don't have much control over the President of the United States or Congress or Mr. Assad in Syria or anything else. I don't have much control over the General Conference. I don't have much control over the Napa Community Seventh-day Adventist Church or the Ray household. Well, a little bit there, you know. There's only one thing that I need to be focusing on, and that's what I've been trying to share with you. It's what God's been pouring into me the last several weeks and months. I need a relationship with Him that will stand any test. And it needs to be not just one way where He comes to me. He needs me to surrender to Him so that He can live in me, so that we can do things together, and that's where you come in. If you're new to the Napa Community Church, or if you're visiting... If you've only been here for a few weeks or months, then uh, you may not have all the background, so you would either have to trust me or see me later or email me so that I can give you some scripture and some books that I would refer you to. This is really pretty basic stuff that we're talking about here. This is very basic Christianity 101, but we just have not done a very good job of preaching it consistently enough and our members have not been confident enough to receive the life-changing good news of what Jesus wants to do in you. So, first of all, your salvation is absolutely assured. Okay? Your salvation is absolutely assured if... Oh, you didn't think I was going to put that in there, did you? Your salvation is absolutely assured if it is your desire to be God's child. You do have to participate in the salvation process. He's not going to save you and drag you kicking and screaming into the kingdom. Okay? So you have to want it. You have to, you have to open your hands and your arms and your eyes and your heart to receive it. But if it is your desire to be God's child and you accept Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life, then it's as simple as ABC. Remember Glenn Kuhn and the ABCs of prayer? How many of you remember that? I remember when I was a student at PUC 40 some years ago and we came down to the Napa Church and I sat right back there, about where you are, Carl. And Glenn Kuhn was presenting the ABCs of prayer. Ask, believe, and claim. It is that simple. God has done all the work. All the work's already been done ahead of you. He's prearranged, predestined, for you to be born again into the exact likeness of his son, Jesus. God's already set that up. He's already made all the arrangements for that. Secondly, he has declared you to be holy. How many of you feel holy? One. Thank you. You should feel holy. You don't believe God? You don't trust God? God has made you holy. God has put Christ's righteousness all over you. That's not good enough for you? I'm telling you, don't go by your feelings, go by his word. I'm telling you, you are holy if it is your desire to be God's child and have Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life. 
It should be obvious that you are holy because your body is the temple of who? The temple of the Holy Spirit, God, yes, who lives in you and lives through you. If you accept Jesus Christ, he moves in. He moves in. The Holy Spirit lives in you by your simple invitation. He doesn't wait for you to get your house cleaned up. He doesn't wait for you to feel holy. Okay? Because you're never going to feel holy because who is it that's reminding you all day, every day that you're not holy? It's not God. Satan just loves to rub it in. Are you kidding me? You holy? Where did I tell that to the rest of the angels? We're going to have a chuckle over that one. Hey, Pastor Marvin thinks he's holy. Can hear the laughter now. God says, I get the last laugh because I've conquered all of that. You have died to the old life. You are a totally new creation in Christ. This is just background, fundamental foundation stuff. Your righteousness, your holiness, your assurance is not based on your performance. It's based on his performance. Okay? Third, we've preached for such a long time the outpouring of the latter rain. We're waiting for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of the latter rain. Quit waiting and start dancing in the rain. The Holy Spirit is here. He lives in you. It's not going to get any fuller than that. Okay? So if he's living here in you, in us, in his fullness... The only thing that's stopping everybody else from knowing it is you haven't believed it and claimed it and let it change the reflection on your face as you communicate with people in your everyday business. We don't have 200 placards in the foyer for you to carry out saying the end is near. Okay? We're, we're, not, we're not doing that. But it ought to radiate from your face that, hey, you know what? I've, I've just begun to realize that Jesus is living in me. And I have to renew that relationship every day because the old man keeps, you know, I, I kill him. But man, he's, he's not a cat with nine lives. He's, he, he pops up multiple times every day. And so I have to keep renewing my mind. But Jesus Christ is there living in me, and I want to let him live through me. The only waiting for the latter rain is waiting for you to recognize that statements one, two, and three are true and let him live. You don't have to change. And if you're trying to change, you're going to fail because you can't change. But he can change you as you recognize his unconditional love and his indwelling presence. Not only can he change you, he can use you. Let's pray. Father, it's time again for us as a body, as a body all together to hear your voice. Speak. Speak, Lord. Speak through the words that I share even if they have to misunderstand to hear it correctly, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would infiltrate our presence. Not only fill us, but fill this sanctuary with your Holy Spirit that we can hear what you want us to hear this morning so that we can leave this place changed a little bit more as you try to grow us into what you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. So the good news this morning is that God is still hiring. We need to put, we need to put a help wanted sign out on the, the church. That would probably draw people in. Yeah. Help wanted. God has a wider variety of jobs open than you could ever imagine. He's got a job for every person. Full-time positions. They all pay exactly the same. 
So don't worry about what job you get. They'll pay exactly the same. And by the way, it's a whole lot more than what you're worth. Okay? So don't sneeze at it. Just accept it and say thank you. Based on your past experience, none of us are worthy. Resumes are not only unnecessary, but they will not be accepted because he doesn't care about what you've done. He's just offering you the position. In fact, not only is he not looking at your resume, but if you tell him that you've been a total failure at everything that you've ever done before, he says, that's just the one I'm looking for. You're hired. So, may I introduce you this morning to four of your colleagues. It's always nice when you start a new job to get acquainted with, uh, with people that you're going to be working with. Start with Exodus chapter 2, beginning with verse 11. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were. By the way, he was 40. <laughs> okay. Some people don't grow up till they're 40. Some of us, never mind. He went out to where his own people were and he watched them at their hard labor. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Now that would make you mad. Glancing this way and that, what's that a clue of? When you're glancing this way and that to see if anybody's looking, what's that a clue of? I'm going to do something I'm not supposed to do, right? I'm going to do something I don't want anybody to see. Glancing this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and he saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? I like that. He asked the one in the wrong. So now Moses has made himself not only executioner, he's made himself judge. He decided who is wrong. I don't think he had a trial. It doesn't say anything about asking, hey, what are you guys fighting about? Well, actually he did. Why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? And the man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me? as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and he thought, what I did must have become known. Yeah, it had become known. In fact, Pharaoh heard about it. And Pharaoh said, I want Moses brought in. I want him killed. He's a problem. He's a problem. I don't care where he grew up. I know who he is. He's a problem. So Moses did what any brave man would do under the circumstances. Ran like crazy. And he ran away and he spent the next 40 years tending his to-be father-in-law's sheep until God came with a help wanted poster. Exodus chapter 3. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And they led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God, Mount Sinai. And there the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. And Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up. And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Don't come any closer. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Wow. What an experience. I mean, we, we hear the story. It's hard to imagine because it's something that doesn't happen unless God so ordains it to happen. So you know the story. God wanted Moses to go back to Egypt and to deliver his people. 
That was the plan. Moses said, I'm not looking for a job. I got a job. Thank you. Don't need this one. God says, you need this one. They go back and forth and they're, and they're arguing. Moses is arguing with God. He's giving him every excuse in the book. In fact, he argued with him so long that the Bible says the Lord's anger burned against Moses. Wow. You don't want, you don't want to have that happen. You don't want God's anger burning at you. But God still gave him the job. Still hired him on the spot. Moses was partially successful, but he often failed in his new position. In fact, he was forced to take a leave of absence from Mount Nebo. God finally retired Moses on Mount Nebo in a grave. But he was also awarded an eternal lifetime achievement award as he appeared early on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus and Elijah. Wow, what an experience. Qualified? Not exactly. Wanted? Yes. Employed? Absolutely. Successful? Yes and no. But he did what God wanted him to do, even though it was reluctant. Now meet a colleague who was called not when he was 80 years old, but called when he was a teenager. David was just a little boy. Well, maybe not a little, probably a little boy when God saw him, but he was a young teenager when God called him, when Samuel anointed him. But David was the all-time rookie of the year and rose to Goliath-sized success and fame for his exploits. Surely here was a man who was worthy of the job, don't you think? Yeah. But we find that even in God's employ, men and women can get to the place where they find themselves self-employed or at least self-serving. And they go on a wrong pathway. And that's why you can't keep your eyes on church leaders, lay leaders, conference leaders, general conference leaders, anybody. We can't watch people because they can go astray. David was guilty of a murder far more heinous than Moses. We could almost justify Moses' murder, although it was wrong. But David's, David's was a murder to cover up adultery. And yet somehow, God saw something different. We read a statement that's a, a quote from the Old Testament, but we read it in the New Testament in Acts 13, 22. After removing Saul, King Saul, he made David their king. And God testified concerning David, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. And David did do everything God wanted him to do. The problem is he did a lot of other things that God didn't want him to do. And he wasn't the only one with that kind of a problem. The New Testament is full of men and women equally qualified to serve in God's employee. Just look at Paul. When he was still known as Saul of Tarsus, God chose him to be his chief instrument for expanding the New Testament church. While he was still Saul. Read it in Acts chapter 9. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. And he went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, the followers of Christ, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed about him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? 
he recognized that this was a divine voice. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Do you ever get a new employee? Do you ever, do you ever work in a place where you have several employees and you get a new employee come in and you don't trust them? There's just, there's just something about them from the very beginning. You say, you know, I don't think this is going to work. I, I just don't think that this is a good addition to the team. That happens even in God's employee. Verse 10 of chapter 9. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. And the Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord. And the Lord said, I want you to go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. And that's when Ananias stopped listening. He never heard another word God said. I want you to go to Judas's house on Straight Street. Yeah, I got it, got it. I know exactly where it is. And there you will find a man from Tarsus, okay, named Saul. He is praying. Ananias was praying. In a vision, Saul has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him, not to choke him to death, but to restore his sight. I just love this. Lord, oh, I have heard so many reports about this man and the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. And just a small point, Lord, I'm one of them. And I'm not ready to die. The Lord said to Ananias, and trust me, he smiled when he said this. Jesus smiled when he said this, but Ananias knew that he meant business too. He just looked at him and he said, Ananias, go. This is your opportunity, Ananias. You're going to get in the record books on this one. Go. This man is my chosen instrument to carry the name, to carry my name before the Gentiles. Now Ananias is just really shaken up. God, your message isn't supposed to go to the Gentiles. We're the chosen people. This guy is not the chosen people. How can you choose him? How can you choose the unchosen to take the message to the unchosen? I mean, it doesn't make sense. He's going to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I'll show him how much he must suffer for my name. Wow. And there you have the man who wrote fully half of our New Testament. Wow. Wow. So the next time somebody new comes into church and wants to get involved in ministry and you're looking at them and saying, they ain't qualified, be careful. Because they might be up here preaching to you one day. Someday God may take a two-pack-a-day smoking alcoholic and make him your preacher. It could happen. Let's look at one more. I think this man you can probably relate to best. Mark chapter 14, beginning with verse 66. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You... You were with that Nazarene Jesus. Now, I don't know or understand what you're even talking about. And he left and went out into the entryway. And when the servant girl saw him out there, 
She said again, only this time to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. And again he denied it. But after a little while, those standing near who had been watching this and thinking said to Peter, surely you are one of them. You are a Galilean. And he began to call down curses on himself. And he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. And that's when the rooster crowed for the second time. And Peter remembered the word that Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. Can you imagine the guilt and the shame that Peter must have felt. This wasn't something that he did outside somewhere on his own. That would be bad enough. But all of a sudden, he heard the roast rooster crow, and he looked over, and he locked eyes with Jesus. And Jesus didn't have a look of betrayal. Jesus didn't have a look of hatred. Jesus didn't have a look of, of denial. Jesus had a look of love and compassion. Jesus didn't say, I told you so. He just looked at him and he loved Peter and it broke his heart. Have you ever been ashamed of the way that you have missed an opportunity to stand up for Christ? Missed an opportunity to witness? Done something that you've wrestled with for so long? Done something again and again and you knew you had denied Christ again? Have you ever felt unworthy of a partnership with Christ? Peter did. And then he met Jesus again. It was the third time that he'd seen him after the resurrection. John chapter 21, verse 15. They'd finished eating, and Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Do you love me more than these? And we're not sure if he's talking about the fish or the other disciples or, or, or what. But do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Feed my lambs. You're hired. Jesus said again, Simon, do you truly love me? Lord, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep. You're hired. And the third time he said, Simon, do you love me with a love like I love you? And Peter was broken because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me like I love you? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you with an imperfect love. But Jesus said, feed my sheep. You're hired. One more time, let me remind you of what I've placed before you. Scripture from the message translation, paraphrase of the Bible, third week in a row. Please read it again. God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape your lives along the same lines as the life of Jesus Christ, his son. The son, Jesus, stands first. He is the prototype. He is the example. He is first in the line of humanity restored. We see the original and intended shape of our lives in Jesus. After God made that decision of what his children should look like, he followed it up by calling people by name. And after he called them by name, he set them on a solid basis with himself. And then after getting them established, he stayed with them to the end, gloriously completing what he had begun. God can finish his work in you. He's just waiting for you to believe it. And all of this struggling that we do, all of this guilt that we pour upon ourselves because of what we have, most of us, been taught 
all of our lives. It just blocks the way. And Satan is delighted by how he's been able to use religion to completely destroy the work of Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He has used all forms of religion to interfere with his process of finishing what he has begun. And it's already done. The work is already done. All you have to do is accept it. All you have to do is walk out of here believing it. Let Jesus live through you. It's a whole new experience. Another portion of Scripture that I've been emphasizing a lot. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verse 14. Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore we're all dead. But he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Don't look at each other by what you know about each other. Judge each other by what you know about Jesus, because Jesus' righteousness is covering every one of you that wants it. Though we once regarded Christ in this way as merely a human being, we do, know so, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. Wow. A new creation. A new creation. Keep reading. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. He brought us together, and he gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sin against them. Is that good news? Yeah. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. That's our message, the one and only message. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. We're hired as though God were making his appeal through us. He is. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. That's not, that's not a good idea that he's passing on to you. That's not a challenge. It's a statement. It's a statement that he's making to you. Be reconciled to God. Because God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So what are you waiting for? I'm going to keep preaching this until we see something happen in our midst and in our community that we know should happen, but you've given up on it a long time ago. We are here to give a message of reconciliation to the community of Napa. And if we lead people into a reconciled relationship with God, he'll take care of opening their minds to want to receive all of the theology that they're going to need to correctly understand Jesus Christ. Our job is to be ministers of reconciliation. What are we waiting for? Your sins are gone. Your old life and your old occupation no longer exists. Your new life is a mirror image of Jesus Christ. God sees you now as 100% holy. It is not you who is qualified for this position. But Christ is qualified for the position. He has demonstrated it, but he now lives in you and through you, and he will never let go of you. You're on the team. Feed his sheep. 
Don't just listen to this message, but I close with 1 Peter 1, verses 13 to 16. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Got it? Prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. You're going to have to battle this stuff day by day, but don't give in to them. Don't conform. Don't offer your bodies as sacrifices to that, but offer your bodies as living sacrifices, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable act of worship. Don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed. How? Renewing your mind. Renewing your mind. Just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Again, that's not a suggestion. It's not a command of something for you to do. It's a command for something that's been done. Be holy. When Jesus stood in the boat and the storm was there, he didn't suggest to the waves that they should calm themselves down. He said, be still. And he's saying to you, be still and know that I am God. And he's saying to us, be holy. Prepare your minds for action. Let Jesus live in you and through you. And now just go and pray and say, God, what do you want that to look like the rest of today? What do you want that to look like tomorrow? What do you want that to look like this week? How should this next week in my life be any different than any past week in my life? What do you want from me, God? What do you want me to do? Pray that prayer. Mean it when you pray it. Duck when he answers. Because it could be just that exciting. Let's pray. Father, we're your people. We are your children called by your name. And we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy and your love for us that is so deep that you're not only willing to put up with us, but you want to live in us, you want to live through us, you want to hire us to be your ambassadors. Lord, I'm not worthy to be your ambassador. But your answer is, but I am worthy, and now it's me that's living in you. So step aside and let me work. Lord, bless us, guide us, help us to let this sink in, help, help me to let this sink in, and, and the week that I have before me and the people that I will encounter Help me to allow you to live in and through me in everything I do and everything I say. Lord, bless this church in Jesus' name. Amen.